Good evening. Tonight's story is The Dead Man's Story by James Hain Friswell from his book Ghost Stories and Phantom Fancies, published in 1858. This story continues our spooky season series. Although it takes place in December and begins with friends sitting around chatting before a fire, it is a dark and strange story. It also has an absolutely incredible twist. The first time I read it, my jaw dropped. Fair warning, this story does have a fleeting mention of the existence of suicide, if that is likely to trouble you. But now, let's open our imaginations and begin. On a dreary night in December, three gentlemen were seated in a painter's studio. The night was intensely dark and cold, and a slight hail beat against the window with a monotonous and ceaseless noise. The studio was immense and gloomy, the sole light within it proceeding from a stove around which the three were seated. Although they were bold, and of the age when men are most jovial, the conversation had taken, in spite of their efforts to the contrary, a reflection from the dull weather without, and their jokes and frivolity were soon exhausted. In addition to the light which issued from the crannies of the stove, there was another emitted from a bowl of spirits, which was ceaselessly stirred by one of the young men as he poured from an antique silver ladle some of the flaming spirit into the quaint old glasses from which the students drank. The blue flame of the spirit lighted up in a wild and fantastic manner the surrounding objects in the room, so that the heads of old prophets, of satyrs, or madonnas, clothed in the same ghastly hue, seemed to move and to dance along the walls like a fantastic procession of the dead, and the vast room, which in the daytime sparkled with the creations of genius, seemed now, in its alternate darkness and sulfuric light, to be peopled with its dreams. Each time also that the silver spoon agitated the liquid, strange shadows traced themselves along the walls, hideous and of fantastic form. Unearthly tents spread also upon the hangings of the studio, from the old bearded prophet of Michelangelo to those eccentric caricatures which the artist had scrawled upon his walls, and which resembled an army of demons that one sees in a dream, or such as Goya has painted, whilst the lull and rise of the tempest without but added to the fantastic and nervous feeling which pervaded those within. Besides this, to add to the terror which was creeping over the three occupants of the room, each time that they looked at each other, they appeared with faces of a blue tone, with eyes fixed and glittering like live embers, and with pale lips and sunken cheeks. But the most fearful object of all was that of a plaster mask taken from the face of an intimate friend but lately dead, which, hanging near the window, let the light from the spirit fall upon its face, turned three parts towards them, which gave it a strange, vivid, and mocking expression. All people have felt the influence of large and dark rooms, such as Hoffman has portrayed and Rembrandt has painted, and all the world has experienced those wild and unaccountable terrors, panics without a cause, which seize on one like a spontaneous fever at the sight of objects to which a stray glimpse of the moon or a feeble ray from a lamp give a mysterious form. Nay, all, we should imagine, have at some period of their lives found themselves by the side of a friend in a dark and dismal chamber listening to some wild story which so enchains them that although the mere lighting of a candle could put an end to their terror, they would not do so. So much need has the human heart of emotions, whether they be true or false. So it was upon the evening mentioned. The conversation of the three companions never took a direct line, but followed all the phases of their thoughts. Sometimes it was as light as the smoke which curled from their cigars, then for a moment fantastic as the flame of the burning spirit, and then again dark, lurid, and somber as the smile which lit up the mask from their dead friend's face. At last the conversation ceased altogether, and the respiration of the smokers was the only sound heard, and their cigars glowed in the dark like will-o'-the-wisps brooding or a stagnant pool. 
It was evident to them all that the first who should break the silence, even if he spoke in jest, would cause in the hearts of the others a start and tremor, for each felt that he had almost unwittingly plunged into a ghastly reverie. Henry, at last said one, again dipping the spoon into the flaming spirit. Hast thou read Hoffman? I should think so, said Harry. What think you of him? Why, that he writes admirably, and moreover, what is more admirable, in such a manner that you see at once he almost believes that which he relates. As for me, I know very well that when I read him of a dark night, I am obliged to creep to bed without shutting my book, and without daring to look behind me. Indeed, then, you love the terrible and fantastic? I do, said Henry. And what do you think of such romances? asked the questioner, addressing the third. I like them much, was the answer. Good. Then I will tell you a strange story which happened to myself. I presumed as much, said Henry. An adventure in which you are the hero? asked the third. Yes, I myself. I must again, before I commence, assure you that I am the hero of this strange adventure. Go on, then. We will listen. The silver spoon fell from his fingers into the bowl. The flame of the spirit, not enlivened by agitation, faded out little by little, and in a few moments they were in almost complete darkness, a warm light only being thrown upon their legs by the fire in the stove. He began his story. One midwinter evening, it, it might be about a year ago, the weather was just as it is now, the same cold, the same sleet and hail, the same dullness. You know my profession is that of a surgeon, and on that day I had a great many cases to attend, so that after having made my last visit, instead of going, as I sometimes did, to the theatre, I made haste home. I then dwelt in one of the most deserted streets of the Faubourg Saint Germain. I was very tired, and I quickly got to bed. I extinguished the lamp and amused myself with gazing at my fire, watching the great shadows which each little flame made dance upon my bed curtains. Then at last my eyes shut, and I fell asleep. It might have been an hour after I first closed my eyes when I felt some person shaking me roughly. I awoke with a start, and not in the very best temper, and stared with some surprise at my nocturnal visitor. It was my manservant. Sir, said he, Rise at once. You are sent for to a young lady who is dying. Where does she live? said I. Nearly opposite, but there is a messenger downstairs who will take you to her. I rose, and thinking that at such a moment my toilette was of little consequence, dressed myself in haste. I took my instrument case and followed the man who had come for me. It rained in torrents. Happily, however, I had only the street to cross, and I was almost immediately at the house of the person who required my assistance. She dwelt in a large and aristocratic hotel. I had to cross a wide courtyard and to ascend a stone staircase which ran up outside the building. Then, passing a vestibule, wherein some servants were waiting to show me upstairs, I was at once conducted to the chamber of this sick lady. It was a very large room, furnished throughout with oaken furniture, very ancient and beautifully carved. A maidservant showed me into the chamber and then left me. I went at once to the bedside, carved like the rest of the furniture, with tall pillars running up to some height, supporting a canopy of rich arras, and upon which, pressing a snowy pillow, lay a head more ravishing than ever Raphael dreamed of when he painted his finest Madonna. Locks, bright and golden as a wave of pactolus, floated around her face. Her eyes were nearly closed, and her mouth partly open, discovering a row of teeth, beautifully even and as white as pearls. Her neck surpassed the lily in whiteness, and when I took her hand I saw so fine an arm that it recalled to me those which Homer has assigned to Juno. I remained there, forgetful of the cause for which I came, gazing at her and recalling nothing like her in my recollections or my dreams, when she turned toward me and, opening her large blue eyes, said to me, I suffer much. Still there was, I found, little the matter with her. I took my lancet, but at the moment of touching an arm so beautiful and white, my hand trembled. However, the feelings of the doctor triumphed over those of the man. I opened a vein. 
There came from her blood pure and bright as melted coral. She fainted. I did not wish to quit her. I remained with her. I felt a secret happiness in holding, as it were, the life of so beautiful a being in my hands. I staunched the blood. She opened her eyes by degrees, carried the hand she had free to her bosom, turned toward me, and fixed upon me a grateful look. Thank you, she said. I suffer less. She had about her such beauty that I felt rooted to my place, counting each pulsation of my heart against the throb of her pulse, listening to her respiration, which each time grew less feverish, and thinking to myself that if ever there existed a heaven upon earth, it must be in the love of such a woman as I saw before me. She slept. I remained, almost kneeling by the side of her bed. A lamp of alabaster suspended from the ceiling threw its golden light upon all the room. The woman who had come with me had gone away to announce that her mistress was better and had no further need of any of the servants. I was alone, and there she lay, calm and beautiful as an angel who has fallen asleep in the midst of a prayer. As for me, I was madly in love. However, I felt that I could no longer remain there. I retired, therefore, without making a noise so as not to waken her. I ordered some little things to be given her when she woke, and I left word that I would return the next day. When I reached my home, I could no longer sleep. I lay awake, thinking of her. I felt that the love of such a woman would be an eternal enchantment made up of reverie and delight. With these thoughts of her, I passed away the night, and when the day came, I was still madly in love. Madly! I was a maniac! However, after these follies of a night so agitated came morning's reflections. I remembered that an unfathomable abyss separated me from the loved object, that she was too beautiful not to have long had someone who loved and would be united to her that she would love him so tenderly, so devotedly, that she could not forget or be faithless to him. So I set myself to hate him without knowing who he was, this man to whom I thought, in my mad way, that providence had given in this world a such exquisite felicity that he could submit to suffer in the next an eternity of pain without a murmur. I waited impatiently the hour when I could again visit her. Each moment seemed an age, but at last the time came, and I set forth. When I arrived, I was shown into a boudoir furnished with the most exquisite taste and altogether with a lavish luxury which was shown in every article of furniture. She was alone, reading. A large robe of black velvet covered her from head to foot so completely that, like one of Perugino's angels, only her face and hands could be seen. She held coquettishly in a scarf the arm from which I had bled her, and was holding to the fire her two pretty little feet, which did not seem formed for our earth, and there she sat, looking so pure and beautiful that I thought her an ideal of one of the angels. She held out her hand and bade me sit down beside her. "'So soon up, madam,' said I. "'You are surely imprudent.' "'No,' she said. I'm quite strong. She smiled sweetly as she said it. Besides, I have slept well and am, moreover, not very ill. You said, however, that you suffered. More in mind than in body, said she with a sigh. You are sad, madam. Oh, deeply so, she returned. But happily, Providence is also a physician, and has found for grief a universal panacea, forgetfulness. But, said I, there are some griefs which kill. True, she said, but the grave and forgetfulness, are they not the same? One is the tomb of the body, the other that of the heart. There is no other difference. But you, madam... How can you suffer grief? You are too high to be touched by it. Sorrow should pass beneath you like clouds pass under the feet of angels. To us come storms and lightning, to you the blue serenity of heaven. Ah, she said, tis there you deceive yourself. There all of your science ends. Your knowledge does not reach the heart. 
Well, said I, try at least, madam, to forget. God sometimes permits a joy to succeed grief, and a smile to follow on our tears, and tis also true that when the heart of one he tries is too wide to refill of itself, and when the wound is too deep to heal without succor, he sends across the path of such a one a soul which can comprehend and know it. For he knows that we suffer less in suffering together, and that a moment must come when the desolate heart must leap again with joy, and when the deadly wound must heal. And what is the prescription, doctor, said she, by which you would heal such a wound? That must be according to the patient, I returned. To some, I should counsel faith. To others, love. You are right, she answered. They are the two sisters of charity who visit the soul. Then ensued a long silence, during which I fixed my eyes upon that sweet countenance on which the light which peeped through the silken curtains cast such a charming tint, upon the beautiful tresses which now no longer floated over her face like a veil, but which were banded on her temples and were drawn behind her ears. The conversation had taken from the beginning a sad cast, but, by this, the beautiful being before me seemed more radiant than before, diademed as she was with the triple crown of beauty, love, and grief. Thus I remained gazing at her, not so mad as I was on the first evening, but the more collected by her quietude. If that moment had made her mine, I should have fallen at her feet, I should have taken her hands, I should have wept with her as a sister, and whilst I reverenced her as an angel, I should have consoled her as a woman. But I was yet ignorant what grief it was which she should forget, or what had caused the deep wound still unhealed. And this was what I had to find out, for between the physician and the patient there was not as yet sufficient confidence for her to own her sorrow, although there had been enough for her to confess the cause. Nothing, however, that I could divine gave me the clue. No one had called at the hotel to inquire for her, None appeared to trouble themselves as lovers would about her. Her grief, then, must lay in the past and must be reflected alone in the present. Doctor, said she to me, suddenly awakening from her reverie, can I soon dance? Yes, madam, I answered, astonished at the question. Because you must know that I must give a ball which I have promised for some long time. You must come, will you not? You will have very little opinion of my illness, which, making me dream all day, does not hinder me from dancing all night. My grief, however, is one of those which must be concealed in the depths of one's heart, so that the world may learn nothing. There are tortures which must be masked with a smile, lest anyone should guess them. Mine I wish to keep to myself, as closely as some would conceal a hidden joy. The world around me envies me as beautiful and happy, it is a deception of which I do not wish to rob them. This is why I appear gay and dance. Surely do I weep on the morrow, but I weep alone. As she said these words, she threw upon me a glance inexpressibly sweet and confiding, and added, You will come. Come soon, will you not? I carried her hand to my lips, and I retired. When I got home, I seemed in a dream. My windows looked upon hers. I remained all the day looking at them, and all the day they were closed and dark. I forgot everything for this woman. I slept not. I ate nothing. That evening I fell into a fever. The next morning I was delirious, and the next evening I was dead. Dead? cried his hearers. Dead, answered the narrator, with a conviction in his voice which words alone cannot give. Dead as Fabian, the cast of whose dead face hangs from that wall. Go on, whispered the others, holding their breath. The hail still rattled against the windows, and the fire had so nearly died out that they threw more wood on the feeble flame which penetrated the darkness of the studio and cast a faint light upon the pale face of him who told the story. He resumed. From that moment I felt nothing but a numbing chill, and a slight but still freezing motion. The latter was doubtless that of being put into the grave. I had been buried for some time, I do not exactly know how long, for there is no timekeeping in the grave. 
when I heard someone calling my name. I shook with cold and fear without being able to answer. After a lapse of some moments, I was again called. I made an effort to speak and then felt the bandage which wrapped me from head to foot. It was my shroud. At last, I managed feebly to articulate, Who calls? Tis I, said a voice. Who art thou? I, 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 was the answer, and the voice grew weaker as if it was lost in the distance or as if it was but the icy rustle of the trees. A third time my name sounded on my ears, but now it seemed to run from tree to tree as if it whistled in each dead branch so that the entire cemetery repeated it with a dull sound. Then I heard a noise of wings, as if my name, pronounced in the silence, had suddenly awakened a troop of night birds. My hands, as if by some mysterious power, sought my face. In silence, I undid the shroud which bound me and tried to see. It seemed as if I had awakened from a long sleep. I was cold. I then recalled the dread fear which oppressed me and the mournful images by which I was surrounded. The trees had no longer any leaves upon them and seemed to stretch forth their bare branches like huge specters. A single ray of moonlight which shone forth showed me a long row of tombs forming a horizon around me and seeming like the steps which might lead to heaven. All the vague voices of the night which seemed to preside at my awakening were full of terror. I turned my head and sought for him who called me. He was seated at my side, watching me, his head leaning on his hands and his face pregnant with a terrible look and clothed with a horrible smile. Fear ran like an electric shock through me. Who art thou? said I, with an endeavor to gather up all my strength. And why dost thou awaken me? To render you a service, he answered. Where am I? In the graveyard. Who art thou? A friend. Leave me to my sleep, said I. Listen, cried he to me. Dost thou remember aught of the earth? No. Dost thou regret anything? No. How long hast thou been asleep? I know not. I will tell you, he said. Thou hast been dead two days, and the last word you uttered was the name of a woman instead of that of the Lord. Therefore, if Satan wished to possess it, your soul belongs to him. Dost understand me? Yes, I answered. And dost thou wish to live? Who, who art thou who offerest me life? Art thou Satan? Satan or not, was the answer. Will you live? Alone? No. You shall see her. When? This very night, and at her own house. I accept it, I cried, trying to rise. What are thy conditions? I make none, said the speaker with a lurid smile. Do you believe that, from time to time, I'm not capable of doing good? This very night she gives a ball. I will take you thither. Let us set out. Good, cried Satan. He held forth his hand and dragged me from the place. You may imagine that what I say was impossible. All that I say is that I felt a penetrating cold which froze all my limbs. Now, cried the fiend, follow me. You must understand that I cannot go out by the great gate. The porter will not suffer that. Once here, there is no retreat. Follow me, therefore, we'll just go to your house where you shall dress yourself, for you can hardly go to a ball in your present costume, especially as it is not a bal masque. Mind and wrap yourself well up in your winding sheet, for the nights are cold, and you may feel unpleasantly touched by it. As he said this, Satan laughed malignantly, and I continued silently to walk after him. I am sure, continued he, that, in spite of the service I am doing you, you do not yet like me. You are always thus, you men, ungrateful to your friends. 
Not that I blame ingratitude, it is a vice upon which I pride myself since I invented it myself, and I must say that it is one most in vogue. But I do wish to see you a little more merry. It is the only thing I ask of you. I answered not, but still followed my guide, white as a statue and as cold. I was silent, but at the pauses in the fiend's voice I could hear my teeth chatter against each other and my bones rattle in my body. Shall we soon arrive? said I, with effort. Still impatient, said my guide sardonically. You must think her very beautiful. As an angel, I cried. Ah, my friend, said he with a laugh, one must confess that you have a want of delicacy in your answers. How can you talk to me of angels, knowing I have been one? In fact, I have done for you today somewhat more than an angel could have done. I excuse you, however, one must excuse a good deal to a man who has been dead upwards of two days. Besides, I am, as I have told you, very good-tempered today. There has happened in the world a few things which please me very much. I did think that men were degenerate. I absolutely fancied that they were getting virtuous. But no, they are always the same, just the same as when first created. Well, today has been a rare day for me. I have seldom found things succeed so well as today. I have counted since yesterday evening 622 suicides in France alone. Among them, there has, however, been more young men than old fellows, which is a pity because they die without children and are therefore lost to me, but 2,443 in the whole of Europe. The other parts of the world I don't count. Uh, there I am like rich capitalists who cannot count their gains. 1,200 judges who have given false judgment. Ordinarily, I have more than this latter number. There are also 27 cases of atheism, cases which give me greater pleasure than all the rest put together. With these and all the others, you will find that they make together a rough aggregate of nearly three million souls in Europe alone. I haven't reckoned petty crimes such as theft, forgery, etc. These are merely the farthings in the gross account, so you can easily calculate in what space of time the whole world will fall into my hands at three million souls per day. I really fancy that I shall be obliged to enlarge my place of accommodation. I understand your triumph. I muttered to myself as I hastened onwards. Indeed, said Satan, with a somber and melancholy air. Do you fear me, then, since you see me face to face? Am I so repulsive? Let us reason a little. What would become of your world without me? It would die of spleen. It is I who invented gold gambling. Tis I, love. Business, tis I. Thinking of these things, I cannot for the life of me understand the spite which you men seem to bear against me. Your poets, for instance, who keep talking of an ideal love, cannot understand that in raving of the love which exalts, they point out the way to that which debases, that in seeking a Diana, they manage to find an Aphrodite. Now, look, for instance, to yourself. You have just arisen from the dead. You are yet as cold as a corpse, and yet you seek the embraces of love. You see, evil survives death, and that a man who has lived a wicked life would, if he were put to the proof, prefer an eternity of his own passions to an eternity of pure and heavenly happiness. I interrupted him with, Shall we soon get there? For the horizon seemed to grow lighter every moment, and yet still we didn't seem to advance an inch. "'How impatient you are!' ejaculated the fiend querulously. "'You must know that over the great gate of the cemetery there is a cross, and that that cross is a kind of barrier or a custom house to me. As I generally travel about for purposes which the cross forbids, I should be obliged to make the sign of it upon my forehead to pass it. Now, I am willing enough to carry on my own little peccadilloes, but the fiend himself revolts at sacrilege. So, as I've told you before, we can't pass there. But never mind that, follow me. I've promised to conduct you to a ball, and I will keep my word. My word, added he sardonically, is well known to be as good as my bond. There was, in all this irony of the fiend, something so fatal, cold and devilish that almost each word which dropped from his mouth seemed to freeze me. 
still, what I tell you I heard with these ears, I couldn't drag myself away from my strange companion. We continued to walk for some hundred feet when we came to a wall before which an accumulation of tombstones formed a kind of flight of steps. Satan placed his foot upon the first and, without any remorse, strode upon the sacred memorials till he reached the top of the wall. I hesitated. I was afraid to follow him, but he held out his hand to me, saying, There is not the slightest danger. You can step upon these paving stones. They are those of some acquaintances of mine. When I had reached the place where he stood, he suddenly asked me whether he should show me the town, but I answered, No, no, let us move forward. We therefore leapt down from the wall upon the ground. The moon seemed to veil herself before the bold looks of Satan. The night was cold. All the doors were closed, all the windows darkened, and the streets deserted. From their appearance, one would have imagined that, for a long time past, no foot had traversed these silent streets. Everything around us bore a death-like aspect. It seemed as if, when day came, no one would open their doors that no head of woman or of child would look out of those dark, dull windows, that no step would break the silence which fell like a pall upon all around. I seemed to be walking in a city which had been buried some ages. In truth, the town seemed to have been depopulated and the cemetery to have grown full. Still, we went forward, without hearing a murmur or meeting even with a shadow. The street stretched for a long way across this fearful city of silence and repose. At last, we reached my house. You remember it? said the fiend. Yes, replied I sullenly. Let us enter. First, said he, we must open the door. It is I, by the way, who invented the science of opening doors without breaking them in. In fact, I have a second key to all doors and gates with one exception, that of paradise. We entered. The calm without continued within. It was horrible. I felt as in a dream. I did not breathe nor move. Imagine, if you can, yourselves entering your chambers after having been dead for two days, finding everything in the same position in which it was during your illness, but wrapped in that dark gloom which death alone can give, and seeing all the objects arranged never again to be disturbed by you. The only thing which seemed to have any motion in it which I had seen since I arose from the tomb was a large clock by the side of which a human being had ceased to exist, and which now ticked slowly on, counting the hours of my eternity as it had the minutes of my life. I went to the mantel shelf. I lighted a wax candle to assure myself of the existence of everything, for all which surrounded me appeared so strange that I could not believe my senses. Every object was real. I saw before me the portrait of my mother with the same smile upon her lips, smiling on me now in death as it had before in life. I opened the books which I had read only some few days before my death. Everything was the same. The only alteration was that the linen had been removed from the bed and that on each chest and drawer there was a seal. As for Satan, he was sitting down upon the tester of the bed, reading attentively the lives of the saints. I passed before a cheval glass, and I saw myself from head to foot in my strange costume, wrapped in my winding sheet, my face pale, my eyes heavy and dull. I began to doubt this life which an unknown power had returned to me. I placed my hand upon my heart. It did not beat. I carried my hand to my brow. My brow was as cold as ice. So also was my chest. My pulse was, of course, as motionless as my heart. However, memory lived within me, and I could move about. The thought was horrible. My eyes and my brain were alone really alive. What was yet more horrible was that I could not detach my eyes from the glass which gave back my figure, cold, pale, and frozen. Each movement of my lips was reflected by a ghastly and sinister smile. I could not quit my place, and I had no power to cry out. The timepiece gave out that dull sound which warns us that it will soon strike. 
then it struck two o'clock. A few seconds after, the neighboring church clock struck also, then another, and another, and all was again silent. By the reflection of the glass, I saw that the fiend had fallen comfortably to sleep over the volume he had tried to read. I turned round and caught my reflection in another glass with that pale clearness which a single wax candle in a vast chamber gives. I seemed haunted by myself. Fear reached its culminating point, and I cried out loud. Satan awoke. Look, said he, not regarding my fear, how you men try to instill virtue into others. Here is this book, absolutely so nonsensical and dull, that I, who have not been to sleep for nearly six thousand years, am obliged to take a nap over it. How is this? Are you not yet ready? Look at me, said I, mechanically. Come, come, answered my companion. Break the seals, take your clothes, and plenty of gold, plenty of gold. Tomorrow, when it's found out, justice will step in and condemn some poor devil for the robbery, and, continued he, condescending for a moment to be vulgar, for the devil is always a gentleman, that will be a little bit of fat for me. I dressed myself in haste, but noticed every time I touched my forehead or my bosom that they were still cold as ice. When ready, I looked at Satan. Shall we see her? said I. In five minutes. And tomorrow, what then? Tomorrow, said he, you may take yourself to your ordinary pursuits and to your common life. I don't do things by halves. Without conditions? Without any. Let us set out then, I returned. We did so, and in a few minutes we were before the house at which I had called some few days previously. Let us go upstairs, said my conductor. He did so. I recognized the grand staircase, the vestibule, the antechamber. The entrance of the saloon was crowded with people. The party was brilliant. The room seemed to glitter, as it were, with light, flowers, jewels, and beautiful women. When we entered, they were dancing. I cannot tell how I felt seeing all these things, and with yet the presence of the grave about me. I took Satan aside and whispered to him, Where is she? In her boudoir, he answered. I waited till the dance was finished. I then crossed the saloon. The huge mirrors, by the light of the chandeliers, reflected my pale and somber figure, and I recognized that death-like smile which had so frozen me. But here, at least, I was safe. Here was no solitude, but a crowd of joyous people. No cemetery, but a ballroom. No tomb, but beauty, ravishing beauty. For one moment, dreaming of her for whom I came, I forgot whence I came. Arrived at the door of the boudoir, I glanced in and saw her. There she sat, more beautiful than beauty's self, chaste as a statue of Diana. I stopped for an instant in ecstasy. She was clothed in a dress of dazzling whiteness with bare arms and shoulders. I thought I saw upon one of her arms the little red point where I had bled her, Perhaps, however, this was more fancy than anything else. When I appeared, she was surrounded by handsome young men, to whose vapid talk she did not, however, seem to listen. Raising her beautiful eyes mechanically, she saw me, seemed to hesitate for a moment, and then, with a sweet smile, she quitted the rest and came to me. "'You see,' said she, "'I am quite strong.' As she said this, the orchestra again struck up. She continued, And you can make proof of it if you wish. Let us waltz together. She then added some words to someone at her side. I looked toward him. It was Satan. You have kept your word, said I. I thank you for it, but this woman must become mine this very night. Thou shalt have her, he said coldly. But wipe your face before you dance. There's a worm crawling upon your cheek. So saying, he departed, leaving me more cold and ghastly than before. To restore my feelings, I pressed the arm of her for whom I had come from the grave, and thus I entered the ballroom with her. 
It was one of those delicious, entrancing waltzes where all those who surround us seem to disappear and we see none but ourselves. So we waltzed with our eyes fixed on each other till they seemed to make a language of their own. Hers seemed to say, I am young and beautiful, and to him who possesses me all the beauties of my heart and soul will be revealed. Still the waltz went on. The measure ceased at last and we were alone. She leaned upon my arm and turned her fine eyes upon me with a look which seemed to say, I love you. I led her back into the saloon. It was deserted. She sat down, reclining on an ottoman, and turned her eyes to me, half closed, as if with love rather than fatigue. I leaned toward her. Ah, said I, if you only knew how I love you. I know it, she answered. I love you equally as well. I would give my soul, said I, earnestly, to possess you as my bride. The eyes of the lady lit up with a fire which resembled those of the fiend. Their light seemed to enter into my soul. Listen, she said anxiously. In a few moments we shall be alone. That door leads to my chamber. Wait till all are gone, and we will ratify the compact. The door opened silently, then shut upon me. I was alone in the chamber where first I had seen her. There was some mysterious perfume which one cannot describe. I glanced in the mirror. I was still as pale as ever. I heard the carriages which took up the guests and departed one by one until the last had disappeared and the silence again became dreadful and mournful. I felt, little by little, step by step, my terrors return upon me. I dared not recall my former thoughts. I was astonished that my mistress never came. I counted the minutes till they seemed hours. I sat down and rested my elbows on my knees. Then I began to think of my mother, who at that moment was weeping for me, my mother, to whom I had been all in life, to whom, alas, I had given but little, too little thought. Then came back the days of my childhood. I remembered that I had never had a moment's grief but that my mother had consoled it. And now, perhaps, when I was about to prepare for a crime, she was passing a vigil of tears and prayers in remembrance of me. The thought was fearful. I felt full of remorse. Tears came into my eyes. I rose and looked at myself again in the glass. My eyes, before dull, seemed to brighten with resolution. I prayed within myself and determined to rush from the present danger. I saw behind me a pale and motionless figure. It was my mistress. She had just entered the room. I rushed past her through the half-opened door, and before I thought of anything else, I regained my own home. In the sanctity of that I remained in meditation and prayer, I was safe from the intrusion of the fiend who tempted me. Not so, however, were my thoughts. In the morning, which slowly dawned, the beauty to which I had so blindly bowed myself seemed to have regained its power. I forgot my good resolutions, I threw behind me my prayers, I again gave up to the passions which devoured me, I determined again to seek her. It was broad daylight when I went out of my room, but by the doorpost a figure, formed, it seemed to me, of a dark vapor, stood and looked at me sardonically. I felt that it was the fiend, and I knew his power over me, and that he followed upon my steps. The day was dark, dull, and cold. I walked carelessly, and, heedless of anything but the purpose I had before me, I at last arrived. At the moment I placed my foot upon the step, I saw an old man, pale and feeble, who was about to descend the flight of stairs which ran up to the door. "'Who do you want, sir?' said the porter. "'Madame P.' I replied. "'Madame P.' returned he, with a look of astonishment, pointing out the old man at the same time. "'That gentleman now inhabits this hotel. Madame P. died three months ago.' I gave a loud cry and fell forward, senseless. A silence fell upon the party who listened to this strange story. None dared for a few moments to break it. At last, one asked, What further happened? 
no one answered. And when they looked through the increasing gloom of the studio, they found that the narrator of the strange story had departed. None knew how or when, nor did either of us ever again meet with the hero of the dead man's story. This story is so good and so infuriating. I want to know what was the deal with Madame P? What was her story? She speaks aside to Satan. Were they working together? If she were already dead and Satan had returned her to life as well, then wouldn't she have had the same absence of a pulse and all the stuff that he had? So his first medical examination would have revealed all that? but maybe the author thinks we don't remember that part. Also, in the beginning, she is living next door to him, so he had probably known that the old man lived there. Despite these infuriating, maybe possibly potholes, I do love this story. The mood is so richly dark, from the beginning description of the firelit chamber where the students are drinking, right through to the sealed house that he kind of haunts. The bit where he gets locked into his own reflection is so so good. And there are all these vaguely nightmarish moments. You know, there's the flickering death mask on the wall. There's walking in the cemetery for hours without getting anywhere. The empty city with nothing but a chiming church bell. Even whirling around in a crazy dance where everything else disappears can be kind of frenetic and nightmarish. It's also funny how charming and agreeable Satan is in this story and how our narrator treats him so badly. Satan is doing him a huge favor, and he's being a good guide, and he's being polite and sociable. So every once in a while, the narrator has to like interject some sentences about how evil the devil sounds, and how dark his voice is, and he's the most sympathetic character in the whole freaking story, and he's also the most alive. He's the most interesting, he's the most compelling, he's the most dynamic, and he's the most actually engaged in the world around him. This is especially interesting because Friswell, like Milton, was deeply religious and actively promoted Christianity, but he makes his interpretation of Satan incredibly charismatic. James Hayne Friswell was a writer, essayist, and novelist. He mostly made his living by contributing to a huge range of publications, along with editing those publications and writing literary criticism. He did publish a large number of books. Some of them are his own novels, short stories, and poems, and a lot of them are collections of classic essays, fables, and other writings with his own notes and commentary. He ruptured a blood vessel at the age of 44, and he became an invalid. He continued to work and write up until a few hours before his death at the age of 52. This book is heavily influenced by the Gothic romances, and this story specifically mentions Hoffman more than once. If you like that kind of thing, and you liked this story, you should click the link in the description below and read the whole book. It's a sort of weird uh, Christmas Canterbury Tales of spooky stories. The framing story of the book is that it is Christmas time, and the narrator has had a good dinner, and he's alone, and he's reflecting on the past, and his thoughts get kind of dark, and then a number of ghosts kind of appear and begin to talk to him, and the rest of the book is each ghost telling their story. It's actually really well written in the sense that he gives each narrator a really unique style and personality, and each story takes place in a different setting and has a different tone. So if that's your kind of thing, I highly recommend it. You should check it out. All of the images in the video this week are in the public domain from Wikimedia Commons, selected to just kind of reflect the ambiance of what's happening in the story at that time. Special shout out to the incredible portraits by French painter Théodore Yericho. These images are exactly the right time period, and they are exactly the right feel for the moment. As you may already know, I make a little confession every week out here at the end of the video. This week's confession is that I am super busy this week and I am very distractible and my mind is all over the place, even more so than usual. Today, I wrote an article about corporate real estate law in New York and conducted an interview with a Danish animated filmmaker while starting a new kind of retail side project with a friend and recording this story. 
I think that leaning into all of these different aspects of my personality and my interests is good for me. It keeps things interesting and complex, um, but it does make it hard to focus and kind of dig deeper into one specific thing. I often find that clients and other people I engage with really want me to focus and dig into their thing and get very invested in it. But then, I mean, to be honest, I need them to get very invested in me, which they usually don't. So I have to keep my fingers in lots of different pies, so to speak, and today is a great example. This is Restored Lore, where every week I find a different weird old story and share it with you. If you like odd and obscure literature and you want to refresh your feed with something different, then subscribe to the channel so you never miss a story. If you want to help me grow, then please also like this video, make a comment, post a share, and help spread the word. Thank you so much, everybody. I will see you next week.